Welcome to Not Too Reads, an audio library of revolutionary texts. Chile, an attempt at historic compromise. The Real Story of the Allende Years, by Jorge Palacios. Chapter 4. The Strategy of Social Imperialism in Chile Both the experience of the UP and its outcome are impossible to understand completely and accurately if one ignores international politics, and, more concretely, the fight between the two world superpowers, the United States and the USSR, to divide the world into spheres of influence and domination. This contention goes on everywhere, in the ideological, political, economic, and military fields. Its particular intensity, in one of these fields or in all of them, depends on the country in question, on its strategic, economic, or political importance, and on the actual historical moment. 1. The Establishment of State Capitalism The ultimate goal of Soviet strategy in countries such as those of Latin America does not differ from the model which the USSR has imposed, manu militari, on the member countries of the Warsaw Pact. That is, state capitalism, run by a bureaucratic bourgeoisie which carries on, in this form, the exploitation formerly practiced by the old bourgeoisie, sometimes allying itself with certain sectors of the latter, demagogically presented as socialism. These new bureaucratic bourgeoisies are composed mainly of the cadres of the pro-Soviet communist parties, which play, before and after power is won, the role of fifth column of the social imperialist bureaucratic bourgeoisie which governs in the USSR, and facilitate its military, ideological, and economic and political expansion. This does not mean that, in the process of development of these local bureaucratic bourgeoisies, as the example of Czechoslovakia shows, Contradictions cannot arise with Soviet social imperialism. The concentration of economic and political power which state capitalism allows, as well as a certain capacity for centralization and for economic planning, and the demagogic pretext that we are building socialism, allow a ferocious dictatorship of the fascist type to be exercised over the masses of the people. The dictatorship has gone to such extremes in the USSR and the countries dominated by it that even some pro-Soviet communist parties, such as the Italian party, the French party, and others, albeit for electoral reasons, have been forced not only to recognize its existence, but also to condemn it publicly. In such socialist countries, all the features of the capitalist system exist, disguised under the legal fiction of ownership by the state, by the whole people. The direct producer is deprived of the means of production, he is paid wages, his labor power is a commodity sold at a price set by the employer, the representative of the state bourgeoisie. The upper bureaucracy amasses fabulous profits, sharing amongst itself all the surplus value created by the workers. In order to lay hold of the surplus value, the upper bureaucracy not only maintains enormous differences in the rates of pay, but also, because of the need to preserve the fiction of the non-existence of profits and of individual gain, it must use the most devious and corrupt practices to enrich itself. Kickbacks, the black market, embezzlement of goods, underground enterprises, and many other practices which are everyday things in these countries. Finally, there are privileges which the very existence of power there confers. It makes it possible to demand, through flattery or through terror, services, gifts, favors, and even forced labor. These mechanisms operate with special force in the USSR because the enormous amount of wealth which the state monopoly bourgeoisie has laid hold of there, because of its social imperialist character. For example, there is one member of the Central Committee of the CPSU who, on his own, managed to embezzle funds in the value of half a million rubles, that is, the equivalent of what the average worker would earn in four centuries. The relations which the USSR maintains with the member countries of the Council for Mutual Economic Aid, Comic-Con, and of the Warsaw Pact, 
are an indication of the relations which it aspires to establish, little by little, with other countries which fall under the control of pro-Soviet bureaucratic bourgeoisies. In these countries, the theory of limited sovereignty, propagated by the Soviet rulers to justify their invasion of Czechoslovakia, is enforced. This means that both their internal and their external policy is subject to the dictates of the rulers of the USSR, who, under the pretext of defending a socialist system, which ceased to exist there long ago, and which the people consequently have no interest in defending, arrogates to themselves the right to intervene militarily. They go so far as to plan to suppress the formal aspects of political sovereignty, and certain theoreticians of social imperialism talk about the necessity of an international political superstructure for these countries, that is, direct government of them by the Soviets, behind the screen of a few local puppets. The political vassalage of the countries dominated by the USSR is nothing other than the instrument for ferocious imperialist-type exploitation in these countries. Because of the Soviet military domination of these countries, this exploitation is carried out by using, in the most shameless way, all the usual methods of the imperialist countries. Buying raw materials at low prices, selling manufactured products at very high prices, higher than world market prices, investing in their enterprises to make profits, forcing these countries to invest in Soviet enterprises, etc. In order to better carry out the various forms of exploitation of these countries, the USSR, in the name of the International Division of Labor, forbids them to develop certain branches of production and forces them to produce what the Soviet industry needs. What is more, their distorted industrial development depends completely on Soviet supply, which accounts for 96% of their oil, 97% of their coal, 80% of their iron, and two-thirds of their cereal grain. Not content with that, the monopoly bureaucrats of the USSR plan, in the future, to completely annex the economies of these countries, maintaining in this respect that, quote, the borders of the national states are too narrow for the development of the productive forces. It is necessary to establish a system of common property within the larger community, end quote. In this manner, the Soviet monopolist and social imperialist bourgeoisie is preparing to absorb totally the economies of these countries, while on its own territory it shares the exploitation of the people with the big international trusts which it is permitted to invest in the USSR, such as the German firm Krupp, Fiat of Italy, Renault of France, and Japanese and US companies. Statistics have shown between 1955 and 1973 the USSR caused five Eastern European countries to lose $19 billion through unequal trade. Between 1954 and 1974, the export of capital to Comic-Con, just in the form of economic aid, exceeded $10 billion, and the Soviets boasted that they had interfered in more than 1,300 enterprises in these countries. Following the US imperialist model, they have already created a superbank within Comic-Con, the International Investment Bank, 40% of whose capital is Soviet, through which they carry on the plunder and control of the East European countries under their domination. In the same way, since 1972, they have been creating multinational economic trusts such as Intertextilmach and Interato Minergo. Soviet social imperialism has also extended the tentacles of its imperialist exploitation to the Third World countries, and is hoping to create in these countries the political conditions which allow it to apply the methods it uses on its Comic-Con neighbors. From 1954 to 1972, the USSR exported more than $13 billion in capital to Asia, Africa, and Latin America, becoming involved in about 1,000 enterprises and taking out more than $19 billion in raw materials at low prices. Sugar, cotton, rubber, oil, mineral ores, etc., at the same time, it sold them, between 1955 and 1973, more than $16 billion worth of industrial products at high prices, making, in the same period, more than $11 billion in profits, just through unequal trade. Not content with these traditional forms of exploitation proper to all imperialism, they are beginning to suggest, as they did in issue number 8 of the journal Communiste of 1973, that the, quote, new form of cooperation, end quote, to which priority must be given, quote, 
in a more and a resolute manner, end quote, is the creation of, quote, joint stock enterprises, end quote, with the USSR, with the goal of, quote, gradually deepening specialization and cooperation in production, end quote, and, quote, sharing gradually and step by step in the socialist division of labor, end quote. They added, unblushingly, that the plan for the economic integration of Comic-Con was open to the developing countries. Thus, they barefacedly show their future colonialist-type plans for the Third World. Although the ruling circles of the USSR are trying everywhere to set up political systems similar to those of the Warsaw Pact countries, which are so favorable to their interests, the tactical paths which they advocate vary according to the positions which the country in question occupies in the world context, as well as according to its international characteristics. In countries such as those of Western Europe, where there are powerful capitalist interests allied to U.S. imperialism, as well as powerful social democratic forces serving these interests, Soviet penetration through the so-called communist parties, which serve its policy, is conceived in a gradual way. In these countries, there is no question at this time of contending for government with the pro-Yankee forces, through a closed bloc of the left. Rather, the effort is made to constrain these forces to ally themselves with the CP in order to get into government with them. The way to force them to share government with the CP is to patiently accumulate mass influence and electoral strength. If the pact is accepted, the USSR will de facto force US imperialism to share with its involvement in these countries, in the parts of the world corresponding to the US sphere of influence. Meanwhile, the camp of the countries under Soviet control will remain closed to U.S. influence and under the firm control of social imperialism. On the other hand, if a fascist regime opposes the attempts to impose a sharing of government, its repressive and anti-democratic nature will be used to discredit the traditional capitalist system and imperialism, and thus to build up strength to demand the restoration of bourgeois democracy and to be able to begin again the process we have described. This policy, however, is not the sole policy, nor is it the same for all country in all circumstances. In some countries, the Soviets have used attempts at coup d'etat, as in the Sudan, or in China with Lin Biao, for example, or military intervention, as in Angola. The nature of the alliance with the pro-Yankee populist or social democratic forces, which the communist parties want to establish as a protective shield to get into government, is determined precisely by the reactionary nature of the regime they want to set up. Winning government power through a left bloc, as the case of Chile has just proved, tends to divide and polarize the forces and can only be defended by opposing the armed apparatus of the traditional bourgeoisie and eventual imperialist intervention, by mobilizing and arming the people to destroy the bourgeois state apparatus and to preserve national independence. But regimes of the type which hold power in the Warsaw Pact countries, in the reproduction of a system of imperialist exploitation such as social imperialism practices against them, are incompatible with any revolutionary mobilization of the people. Moreover, at the present time, the USSR does not have the strength to impose such regimes through armed intervention in countries which are key points for US imperialism and which the latter could defend even at the price of war with the USSR. As a result, at the present time, the advance towards the Eastern European-style socialist model requires, as a first step, the preservation of the bourgeois state apparatus against the people, the strengthening of this apparatus through the advance towards state capitalism, the infiltration of this apparatus thanks to the relative tolerance of the traditional bourgeois forces. The basic elements of this strategy are the winning of widespread mass influence by the pro-Soviet CP, by taking advantage of the capitalist crisis and by practicing demagogy, the effort to infiltrate the bourgeois armed forces, and the attempts to establish an alliance with the populist or social democratic forces, which contend with the CP for large popular and middle sections. In the face of this revisionist strategy, more important than ever is the idea formulated by Mao Zedong, in accordance with the basic theses of the Marxist classics, when he stated, quote, Without a people's army, the people have nothing. End quote. To impose state capitalism, 
to subordinate the country to social imperialist exploitation, it is necessary to have armed forces of the type which exist in the capitalist regimes, foreign to the masses of the people and opposed to them. Exactly the opposite of the Marxist concept of the people in arms. That is why, for the phony communists, it is indispensable to preserve the bourgeois armed forces, to win them over to their cause and or to restructure them little by little in order to put them at their service. Never must they be destroyed by the people in arms. The discussion which Khrushchev had with an Albanian leader during his last visit to Albania, before the break between the two countries and the two parties, is symptomatic in this regard. In his travels throughout the country, Khrushchev saw peasants working with rifles on their shoulders. He asked how it was possible that people who did not belong to the armed forces were allowed to bear arms. The reply was that in Albania, socialism is defended not only by the people's army, but also by arming the entire people. Khrushchev still insisted, pointing out that this would create a serious problem if all these armed people turned against the government. The Albanian leader answered that, for such a thing to happen, the government would have to be implementing a policy opposed to the interests of the people, and that, in such a situation, it would be very positive for them to turn their guns against the government. Khrushchev did not open his mouth again on the subject during the whole trip. The strategy conceived by the Soviet leaders to penetrate Latin America is similar to the one we described above. Although these countries do not have as much importance for U.S. imperialism on the military, economic, and political levels as does Europe, they are neighbors of the U.S., and have sometimes been defined as its backyard. Consequently, the U.S. government does not seem prepared to tolerate there any regimes of the type the USSR has created in Eastern Europe without doing its utmost to block such regimes. This is why it is reasonable for the USSR to act very cautiously and gradually in this region, seeking to infiltrate their governments, their states, and their armies, which prop them up through an alliance with mass-based political parties that oppose social imperialism under the orders of the US.